Okay, guys, we'll get started here. <clears throat> so thanks for coming. This is the Canadian Snowboard uh, Workshop. My name is Jeff Chandler. I'm the National Technical Coordinator with CASI, the Canadian Association of Snowboard Workers. And Luke Belanger is going to help out with the presentation as well. So, um, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to highlight here right off the bat is just sort of the nature of um, the certifying bodies in Canada. And it's we're in kind of a unique environment in Canada where each of the different disciplines falls under a different association, which is quite different from, from most other countries where you have a single association that would be sort of the umbrella over top of ski and snowboard and mountain mark. Whereas in Canada, we have the CSIA, which is the Ski Instructors Alliance, CASI, which is the Snowboard Instructors, CANSI, which is Nordic, um, and then CAT, which is our Adaptive Association. So one of the things that we're trying to do here at the Inter Ski event um, this year is to sort of um, try to present a more of a unified message in terms of what our goals are amongst the four associations. And um, one of the, the big things there is that we're trying to develop relevant snow sports professionals or instructors based on the needs of our industry partners, and especially the resorts. Um, really, we exist in Canada, those associations exist in Canada to serve the needs of the resorts and provide the resorts with instructors that are trained to deliver the product that they, that they need to deliver. <coughs> Um, as far as CASI itself, uh, the Canadian Association of Snowboard Instructors, we will celebrate our 25th anniversary next year. So we were formed in 1994. <clears throat> um, we have approximately 8,000 members um, that span not only Canada, but we have more and more international members as well. And since 94, we've certified over 40,000 snowboard instructors. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're an independent snowboard association. <clears throat> so what are we going to talk about today? Um, one of the big topics of discussion in Canada or in North America recently has been the question of retention in snow sports. Um, so with that in mind, it's led us to identify a couple of challenges. One is creating new participants in snowboarding, and two is turning those beginners, people trying snowboarding, into actual snowboarders. And so from Cassie's perspective, one of the solutions that we've tried to tackle is to provide snowboard instructors with usable tools that can help them to create successful snowboard lessons. So we have lots of different tools that we try to give our instructors to uh, try to address this question of retention. Um, for today, we're going to talk about just a few of those, uh, few of those tools. So the first one is the Quick Ride system, which basically is our beginner teaching methodology. So um, it provides new instructors with a framework for teaching beginner snowboarders um, and catering the experience to the individual client. The second one that we'll talk about is our practical teaching skills, which um, uh, these skills create a consistent tool for assessing um, the teaching skills of instructors across all of our certification levels. <clears throat> and then the third one is the uh, riding competencies, which help to ensure that our <coughs> teaching is outcome-based, relevant, and adaptable. So these are the three things that we'll, we'll cover today. So the Quick Ride system is our beginner teaching system. Um, and we've had this quick ride system in place for probably 10, 10 or 12 years now, but it's something that's continually evolving. <clears throat> so initially it was just a beginner progression that we would give to new instructors to help them teach a good beginner lesson. And when we first introduced the quick ride system, it was also a, part of it was a technical model, the other part was more of a promotional model to help resorts in Canada to promote taking beginner snowboard lessons or um, promote uh, taking a lesson in general. Over the years, it's really evolved and changed a little bit. And um, where we're at now with our Quick Ride beginner, beginner system is that it's more of a flexible progression or a flexible framework that allows instructors to cater that beginner experience to the, to the individual student that they have in front of them at the, on the day. Um, the primary goals for the Quick Ride system are mobility, independence, and fun. So we heard, uh, for example, with the Swiss lecture the other day, if a, if a student can leave the lesson of having had, had fun and had a good time, then that's the primary goal. The other thing that's interesting is that the idea of mobility and independence where there's been a lot of work done in Canadian resorts where um, they found students that leave the lesson with more mobility and even a sense of independence from the instructor are more likely to return and snowboard again. But if they leave the beginner lesson and they're still reliant on holding the instructor's hand or they're not, they're not able to practice on their own, chances are they won't come back and snowboard again. <coughs> so you have a uh, more of a detailed overview of the quick ride system in your little handout that we have here. 
But basically, the quick write system is broken up into five um, steps or phases or stages, however you want to think of it. And, and the key with this quick write system is it's, uh, it is a progression, but really it's a, it's a series of goals. And what we try to get instructors thinking along the lines of is that um, achieving those five goals using whatever tactics or exercises or tools are necessary. So the first goal is just the basics. So learn how to use the equipment and learn and gain comfort moving around on the snowboard with one foot attached. And so what we try, really try to pass on to new instructors is that's your first goal. Work within that goal, um, highlighting those, those two points of equipment and mobility and using the tactics that we provide to them that, that are aligned in this goal period. And once that goal is achieved, then they're free to move on to the next goal. So the second goal with the quick ride system is uh, simply sliding. So to become comfortable standing on the snowboard while it's sliding. So really this is just simple straight running. Um, getting them comfortable with that sensation of gliding, uh, adding in some little balance, balance challenges, uh, and then introducing um, braking using the free foot and a little bit of turning motion as well. <clears throat> the third step in the quick ride system is called control. Um, and basically what we're trying to do here is control speed and direction. So controlling speed using the edges, edge angles, side slipping. Uh, and controlling direction using kind of a, a either a traverse or a pendulum type motion. One of the, this is probably the step, the third step is probably the one that's evolved the most over the last few years for us. And we've adopted more and more of uh, one foot approach to this control phase. So you can see in the video here with Jamie. Um, we try, basically the, this whole quick ride system is split in half where the whole first half is done with one foot attached and then the second half is done with two feet attached. And what we found when, we, when you think of that idea of mobility and independence, um, it really allows the student to have that, have that sense of independence. And they have that free foot as a bit of a, um, a, bit of a, a break or a crutch if they need it. And you're not having a situation where the instructor is being forced to hold on to the student all, all the time. So this one foot itself has been really successful. <coughs> um, definitely takes, has taken a little bit of time to get instructors to adopt it and to use it but we've seen a, a lot of success with it. And then when we get to the point where we can strap the back foot in, uh, the success of the student is, is, has been much greater as well. So once speed and con uh, control of speed and direction are there, then we get into turning. So essentially just changing it just at the ball line. So this would be like a beginner or a real basic, basic sliding turn. <clears throat> um, focusing on that idea of using, initiating the turn using the lower, lower joints, the hips, the knees, and the feet. And then the final step in the quick ride system is, uh, we call it flow. Really, it's about learning to move around the mountain safely. So not just about how to turn, but also where to turn. So identifying points, places on the mountain and in the terrain that are, are um, uh, good points to turn. Adding a little bit of extra skill in there with some um, uh, up and down movement in the, in the turning, some sliding 360s, some sort of some uh, little extra things that uh, instructors can give to students at this level. This is really the novice level for us. So a big part of this quick ride system for us is trying to pass on this concept of decision making to instructors. So um, it, it can be sometimes difficult if you've got a, for example, a level one in, in Canada can be 15 years old. So getting a 15 year old to um, think about teaching in, this, in terms of this decision-making sort of idea, but we're trying to pass that on as early as we can that um, the quick ride system or the beginner lesson can be adapted to the situation that you have in front of you. So whether that's the student demographic and athletic versus non-athletic, um, previous no sports experience, psychological state, whether it's the lesson situation, is it a private lesson, a group lesson, or a kids versus an adult lesson, or the environment that you're teaching in, so the, the terrain or the slope, the snow conditions or the weather conditions. So really trying to pass on the idea that um, each beginner lesson may look different, or no two beginner lessons will look the same. It really comes down to the student that's in front of, in front of you at the time. And like I said earlier, the big three goals there with this quick ride system are mobility, making sure that the student leaves that lesson you know, mobile and able to move around on their own, independence, 
and, and fun. And as it says there, if students leave the beginner lesson and are not able to continue development independent of the instructor, they're less likely to return. Second thing, um, the practical teaching skills. So as uh, Jeff mentioned there, it's keys to presenting effective lessons. So we have a series just like we have the writing skills that we've had for many years. We, over the years, um, to realize that we need some, like, you know, we always had some teaching standards or whatnot, but just label it more as different skills that a teacher uh, needs to have or needs to master, per se, depending on what level of teaching they're at, and to provide a good experience for guests and lessons. And those are the skills that we're looking for and passing on and uh, training our instructors to, um, to do better with, essentially, right? And we'll go, we'll, go through, uh, we'll go through those, and we also go with instructor trainers, here's the practical teaching skill to structure pedagogy training session for snowboard instructor on the level three and four as well. So we carry those teaching skills, they are the same, all the way through, just like the writing skills and what. Okay. So first one, you have that in your book as well. I believe it's like the, the very last page you have, like, um, so if you want to follow along in there, which is the notes that I'm using here. So guest service and safety. It's uh, fairly, fairly self-explanatory, this one, right? You want to provide uh, a good experience to the students in your lesson, and you also want to keep them safe. Right, uh, I run a snow school in Ontario, and you know that's that's the first thing we tell them. It's like make sure you bring, make sure they come back at the end of this lesson. Right, <laughs> make sure that you keep them safe, that you take like the right steps to show them a good time, but you know they also want to have a safe time. It doesn't really matter how good it was up until they got hurt pretty bad. That's all they're gonna remember. Right? Not how awesome Luke was right up until I broke my leg or anything like that, right? So uh, safety is paramount there. So uh, safe and suitable teaching terrain. Uh, positive and student-centered environment, and the teaching is safe as set. So the teaching environment, we talked a little bit about that in the safe session, if you attended that today. Uh, you know, how many times do we see people rushing to the top of the mountain too quickly, uh, you know? And just making sure you pick the right environment for what you're trying to achieve. Right, and the levels you're trying to achieve there. Um, Student-centered, um, there was some good discussion about that today, that it's, when we talk about student-centered is, uh, not everybody has the same things to work on at the same time, right? So um, I love hearing from some instructors, it's like, boss, I got a split. It's like, well, of course you have a split because you have more than one person. Right? <laughs> as soon as you have more than one person, you have a split. There's an ability different there, so it forces you to uh, push yourself to just like cater slightly to each person, right? Individual feedback is something that comes up a lot, right? Uh, that we, it's not always, not everybody is always working on the same thing or needs the same uh, thing worked on. So it's uh, it's to each individual within the frame that you put of the group, like they have different feedback for each to achieve the goal that you set for them or achieve the task that you set for them. And we flow to communication and lesson structure. Um, communicating effectively. We talked about it in the Swiss session, we had some uh, a good discussion about that in here, uh, about you know simple language, keywords, right? Uh, especially um, you get more and more, you know, English second language people taking our courses. Right, or if we do, or a French second language or whatnot. So I think the explanation is like clear and simple, so that the student or the candidate on the course can take away the information, right, and not have like not have any doubt about like what we're telling them essentially, right. So keeping it simple and clear, uh, effective, and an effective lesson structure. Uh, you know, a method of presentation. Which way am I going to roll out this material? Uh, there's a few different ways, you know, we have a few different methods of presentation that we uh, that we call some of our teaching strategies, such as whole part whole, which some of you guys have heard before, uh, guided discovery, uh, building block approach, so depending on the level of the students and where they're at in their writing and what you're trying to achieve, then any of those methods of presentation can help you bring some great structure into your lesson there and just effective teaching essentially. And sometimes, you know, it's a blend of all three. <laughs> you know, parts of your lesson will be a building block and then it morphs into like a whole part hole for a little bit. And then towards the end, you know, you get them to discover this a little bit like on their own by leaving them with questions and taking them to certain terrain that's making them do certain things that maybe they haven't planned on doing in the first place. So. Demonstrations. 
This one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, we have a teaching principle that telling does not ensure learning, <laughs> right? So the student has to try what we're talking about, and you also need to show them a good picture. That's, you know, your explanations are essentially incomplete if you don't give them a picture to look at, right? To cater to uh, as many types of learners as we have. Lots of very visual learners, some are very like cognitive learners, they wanna ask questions, they want every single little detail that you can give them. So we try to give them a good, clear, concise explanation, and following that, we need to give them a good, clear demonstration, right? To essentially, um, do what you said you were going to do, you know? Give them the closest picture so that to help them get like a good understanding of what they need to do, so. Analysis and improvement. That's essentially feedback is what that is the default word like for most countries there. It's providing them the, that's essentially why they come to a lesson. Someone comes to a lesson, they wanna get better or you know, candidates come on an improvement session or someone on a course, they wanna know what they need to work on. So you're going to analyze their performance and you're going to provide them with improvement, right? What can they do better? So recognizing what's, why are they struggling with this maneuver? Or why are they struggling with this particular movement, right? It's, it's a skill to be able to, like the eye, to be able to see what's glitching in the sequence of movement per se, right? And how do we, and that's what we're gonna pull out and you know, we're gonna work on that and come up with an improvement plan for it, you know? And we say, I think you need to do a little bit of this, a little bit less of that, and then hopefully we're gonna give them a tactic or an exercise or maybe a different movement or an, anal an analogy or a metaphor <laughs> uh, to them to help them get to that goal, okay? And we try to keep that positive as much as possible, um, you know, especially with the guests the snow school that comes, you know? You, they don't always need to know everything they're doing wrong. They really, we really want them to focus on the things they need to do moving forward to get better or to maintain performance or increase performance or whatever it might be. And then when you're on course with a candidate, you know, at a level three, let's say, or level four, then, you know, they also need to hear what they're doing wrong, right? Because they're able to self-analyze a little bit more, right? And they know something is not quite right, but they can't put their finger on it, and they want to know as well. And the whole thing is like, together, we're going to improve your snowboarding. It's sort of the positive spin that we put, that we try to pass along and promote. <coughs> and, put on. and the last but not least, <laughs> technical content of your lesson. So you can have a great explanation, you're analyzing well, you got a great eye, you're a positive person, everything is safe, but what you're teaching them at this, uh, at this time, let's say, maybe potentially does not support the goal that you set in the first place. Is the goal is to do, let's say, a 360 or whatnot, and the tactics that you bring forward to get them to be successful at 360 are maybe technically incorrect, or is really not working for the people in the group here, right? So you're, if your tactic or your strategy to improve them does not support the goal that you set in the first place, then, you know, you're most likely not gonna reach that goal. So technical content, so effectively present the concepts in line with what we promote with techniques and methods. Make sense? And then we take those, uh, we take those teaching skills, so that's the teaching side, as the standard and what we promote and how we want people to teach in the Canadian system. And um, here are some of, like, some of the greater outcomes that we're looking for at different levels, okay? We'll go through what we call our competencies. And uh, we had this model the last time we were at Interski at Ushuaia there, and uh, we, uh, we, we're refining them year over year. It's probably one of our, uh, that's all in your little blue book, by the way. <laughs> I see you guys taking pictures, but all the information is in there as well. Um, that we give them clear outcomes. Nobody comes to the snow school desk and asks, I want a lesson to improve my edging skills. Maybe it happens. Someone that really knows a more advanced lesson potentially. But people come and say like, I want to get better at carving, or I want to get better at box, or I want to be like just a better, more flow in my riding, or things that are more sort of broad like sort of things. So we created those to give more defined outcomes it's also a great analysis tool for our instructors, you know, like it's a filter they can kind of look through and see is, you know, the, some of our basic competencies here, the core ones, sorry, core competencies, centered in mobile position. 
So let's say at a novice and intermediate level, like we want them to find, like to be in and around the center of the snowboard, but not locked in there. If they have to get out of the middle a little bit to make some adjustments, like we're looking for a bit of mobility in all the planes, right? That they can move if they need to, right? But generally, at the lower speeds and minimum terrain, if you're in the middle of the snowboard, that's probably gonna go well, right? If you're too far to one end or the other, uh, you might not have as good of a time as you had hoped. Okay, so adaptable position is the, is the, is the key word in there, right? So that you're centered, but you can also get in and out and adjust as you need to. Uh, we have three core competencies. The second one, turning with the lower body. So efficient, efficiency requires that we use the hips, knees, and feet, or a combination. So in the safe session that I led today, we focused on some short radius turn. And we talked about, like, you know, the turning effort come with, uh, comes from the lower body. You know, we want to use the smaller joints, so the knees, the ankles, the feet, uh, you know, to make that happen. So there was a time <laughs> Well, we really promoted some rotation, you know, in big anticipation of the upper body to lead the turning effort. And we slowly found over the years that it's not the most efficient way to get the snowboard to turn. You know, at a beginner level, does it work? Absolutely, it works. You know, if you get someone to twist their upper body and they're patient enough and you're on the right terrain, snowboard will come around, right? I'm teaching my kids right now with seven and three, it works, <laughs> right? But as you progress and as the speed increases, you know, as the terrain increases and whatnot, like it's really the lower body that we want to use here. So what we've changed over the years is we used to teach them rotation to turn the snowboard and once they got that down, we told them it's like, okay, now stop doing that. Now let's use your feet and your lower body to get the snowboard to turn. So now we promote that right from the get-go, right at the beginner stage, like, you know, we get them develop mobility in the lower body and using them and twisting the feet and just that's the most efficient way to turn a snowboard that we have found. Last core competency, balance over the working edge. So combination of inclination and angulation, right? <laughs> so we have inclination like, you know, the big move, moving the big joints, your upper body, your hips, like inside the arc, okay? So that you position yourself to be able to stack yourself over the edge and resist the forces that are coming at you while you make a turn or forces from the joint. <laughs> and then as, you know, you're gonna use angulation to refine that position because we know that if we just use inclination we found that today in the conditions that we have right you need a little bit of a combination of the two right the big move of inclination to set the initial platform and then using the smaller joints to make small adjustment and refine your position to maintain balance over the edge throughout the turn no matter what type of turn right looking for grip the big takeaway. So in our level one and two, for, uh, uh, for just a bit of context for you guys here, novice and intermediate. So our level one, we, you know, novice, intermediate, advanced, expert, the progress level one through four is sort of the, the teaching levels that we're looking for and the riding level that we're looking for as well. So, and then at level three and four, we start diving into more advanced riding competencies. So more advanced outcomes that come with riding faster, Riding steeper terrain, riding varied terrain, and you know, and then you get to the level four, it's like it's gotta be on all the time, any situation, any turn, at any point. So we'll go through those quickly with you guys as well. So strength and flow. Um, having a strong position on the snowboard, right? If uh, you can uh, that can uh, that can take many forms depending what you're trying to attempt. Right, today we're doing car turns. We promote something called separation in the Canadian system, you know, to create a bit of tension in your core so that you can move the inside the arc and have a stable position here. Find stability within the turn there so that you can resist the forces, right? And if you're able to find a strong position on the snowboard and you're able to resist the forces that are building into a turn and bank against the forces, uh, let's say, you're most likely going to find flow. Right? It's gonna flow from one turn to the next. If you have a stable position for the first half of the turn and then the forces get greater in the second half, let's say you collapse on yourself or whatnot, then most likely the turn is not gonna finish so well, therefore like sort of interrupting flow from one turn to the next. So that's something that we look for as you know we progress through the levels and ability of the ride. Arc to arc, it's a tough one to explain. 
Of course. I like to talk about arc to arc. So just using the geometry of the snowboard, side cut and flex, to create forces in the turn or maneuver, which can be directed into the next turn. So when we go from one turn to the next, arc to arc, I really think, I often think about it as like a little bit of that magic carpet ride you get sort of in between one turn to the next, right? Like the board bends, it snaps back at you a little bit, and then you're gonna use that rebound or that snap of the board, and you're going to go place the board into the new turn. You're gonna get onto the new edge and start a new turn, right? Arc to arc is having a bit of a plan, you know? Where are you going with this run here? Like, you know, if you look down the hill, I do you have a plan of you're gonna take those forces from one arc and send them into the next arc, right? So that you have, you're successful. Going somewhere with a purpose. Sometimes we see candidates, they just do, they try to do the exact same turn, like really close, let's say, or really, really round turn, too round of a turn or too open in any situation. It's something that is, it's variable, it needs to be adjusted depending on what kind of terrain you have, what kind of snow you have, what's the outcome that you want, you know, what's the task at hand here, all those things. Loading and deflection. Similar to arc to arc, establishing edge grip and resisting forces creates the bend in the board. So, which can then be used to deflect a rider in a new direction. So we talk about the rebound of the board, so we bend it, snaps back at you like we were just talking about. What are you gonna do with that rebound of the board? If you loaded the board nicely, it is going to snap back at you. What do you do with that snap, right? If you just throw it up in the air at the end of the turn in a vertical way, and you jump, you land, and then you start the next turn, right? You haven't really deflected this, the loading of the board that you're getting the snap into the next turn to help you start the new turn, right? We say that a lot. It was really icy on the demo slope on Monday night when we were there. So I struggle, few of us <laughs> struggle to find grip. And then we buy, like, I was having, like, we couldn't find, it was really hard to find grip, so then I was really having a hard time loading the board, and I was getting hung up until I found the grip to bend the board and help me get, push me into the next turn a little bit, right? Um, so it's something that we have been tweaking a lot, the definition of loading and deflection, right? But seeing people that they're able to control that rebound. Load, you're able to load the board, and you're able to control that rebound and put it to good use, essentially. And you know, that works also in like a freestyle concept, right? Or a freestyle environment sort. So if you go on a jump, right? You're going to load the board going up the takeoff and then you're going to deflect this vertically, right? To get more air off the jump. If you want to pop higher on the jump or ollie higher up off the jump, right? That's also loading and deflection, right? And all, you're loading the board, you're deflecting the pressure like up in the air. So loading and deflection. So all those competencies apply in different environments. Last but not least, steering versatility. Blending movements to allow the snowboard to slide or carve, or a blend of each, as well as create varied turn size and shapes. So varied terrain is a great example of that. You're riding in the trees, you're riding in the bumps, ungroomed terrain. It's not a consistent surface, right? It'll be softer in spots. Some spots are gonna be a little bit more hard pack. Hey, there's a tree right there. You better make a turn around it and not go right into it, right? So it's, it's not about doing the exact same turn all the way down in any situation. It's more about doing a turn at the right place at the right time so that you, know, you can manage the terrain that's in front of you, okay? And be successful on the road. That means that you have to be able to do like some shorter turns, some longer ones, somewhere in between. Sometimes you gotta do a really quick one, a really quick pivot on the tail in the bump, so you get around this tree, or that you get over this bump, and that helps you like get around the next one. And same thing on a groom run. You know, the groom run conditions we had this afternoon with, uh, that was in Keith's group that's in the room here. Uh, and you know, the, we did some carving, and <laughs> some exactly carving conditions out there. It was pretty, pretty soft, but it was super fun. And it allowed, you had to adapt it, right? You had to be versatile. You couldn't do the exact same thing as you would do on a perfect card pack, like corduroy morning. Because it was so soft, you had to adjust the, uh, the amount of edge that you were there. And I found out the hard way, I ended up on my ass a couple times, right? Because you just, it was just so soft and sort of unpredictable, a little bit that way. So having the versatility in your riding to adapt to these situations is uh, paramount, key.
and the writing skills. You've heard of our skill concept before, I'm sure. So we promote those greater outcomes of the competencies, but those competencies, you know, if you're if you're successful, if you, if you have you know strength and flow in your riding, let's say, and you have good spear and versatility, and we're seeing that in arc to arc. So that's they are all a combination of all of the five skills coming together to create this outcome that are the competencies. So. I can, let's say a competency, I'm just the image out of my mind, I look at someone riding and it's not quite there, then that's where I go into my five skills and I'm gonna break down the riding within those skills and then I'm gonna pull one out and work on it. You know, I say, okay, it's this position that's really glitching here at this point in the turn, right? So if I adjust this position, you know, at the end of this heel side turn, that's gonna set up this toe side turn really well. You know, so maybe I'm gonna work on my lesson my goal will be to just improve his position and balance here, and maybe I'm gonna spend an hour or two working on it. You know, come up with tactics to develop a movement or a sensation, a sensation sorry, so that we can adjust this position and be more successful, or be successful at the task of the outcome that we set out in the first place. Okay, same thing, so we have position and balance, greater one, like the base of our, the foundation of our skill system, you know, and then obviously like the edging, the pivot, how we turn our feet, you know, the pressure, how we manage that pressure that's building up through the forces or through the terrain. And then all that, you know, with timing and coordination is another skill that we're going to... Are we able to coordinate all these movements and do them at the right time in the turn or in the maneuver so that we're successful at this outcome that we've set in the first place? Okay, so it's a way to break down the riding, essentially. Lots of information. All right, thanks. So just to sort of wrap it up here, <clears throat> the, really the big goal that we uh, have set for ourselves is to create uh, instructors that can present effective lessons, right? So effective lesson being a lesson that gets a student to come back for another lesson. Um, so we really strive to um, train our instructors to provide a product that's participation focused. So the primary goals for instructors should be to create a safe, fun experience that builds mobility and independence on the board. And also industry relevance. So it's crucial that these instructor training programs are relevant to uh, resort snowboard school needs. And that's the big key for us in Canada is that we are we really are a partner with the resort with Canadian resorts. And um, for them to continue using Cassie snowboard instructors, we need to provide uh, relevant programs or relevant uh, trained instructors for their needs. <clears throat> So that's pretty much it for us. We do have a downloads page set up, <coughs> excuse me, on our uh, Interski blog site, um, where we've got uh, digital versions of this booklet, we've got our teaching manual there, different course guides, all that sort of stuff. So you feel free to maybe grab a photo of that there and, and uh, use the password to log in. And we'll leave that up for maybe another week or so after, uh, after this week. That leaves us with uh, <coughs> Five minutes. Much guys, please come up and grab if you didn't get any. Four guys, stickers, pins, what's up?